My name is John Malkin, and this is Transformation Highway. This is KZSC 88.1 FM, kzsc.org, broadcasting from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Neurolinguistic programming is a set of psychological communication techniques and practices for creating change and supporting well-being that was developed in the 1970s here at UC Santa Cruz by Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Grinder was a professor of linguistics at UC Santa Cruz. In January 2024, about 100 NLP trainers from 15 countries came together in Santa Cruz to attend a weekend leadership summit to discuss mutual interests and mutual problems in the world of neuro-linguistic programming. Today you'll hear interviews with two prominent longtime NLP coaches, Robert Diltz and Michael Hall. Robert Diltz lives part-time in Paris and part-time in Santa Cruz, and he's the author of over 30 books, including Strategies of Genius, Sleight of Mouth, and Neuro-Linguistic Programming, Volume 1, which he co-authored in 1980 with Richard Bandler, John Grinder, and Judith DeLozier. Michael Hall lives in Colorado and is a therapist. He co-founded Neurosemantics in 1996. Hall is the author of almost 60 books, including Unleashing Your Creativity and NLP Secrets. He told me that one of the goals of the 2024 Leadership Summit in Santa Cruz was to create a more unified voice to respond to people who advertise themselves as neuro-linguistic programming coaches, but are, quote, degrading, cheapening, and contaminating it and making it less professional. To begin, here is Michael Hall talking about the recent January 2024 NLP Leadership Summit that took place here in Santa Cruz, which included a caravan car tour of sites at Stevenson and Kresge Colleges at UCSC that were significant during the development of NLP in the 1970s. Would you say more about being in Santa Cruz? And I know from your notes about the summit that happened here in January that you went on a caravan ride around yeah. UCSC and revisited sort of the beginnings of neuro linguistic programming here. Yeah. Yeah. The the 44 of us, I think it was 40, for we got in eight or nine cars and made that caravan. And, and Robert Diltz was in the front car. Uh, with Judith Delosier, and we uh, all tuned our phones and everything to so we could hear them um, tell the story as we went. We went up to um, Stevenson College and got out and, and walked onto the campus there. Uh, that's where a number of NLP things had occurred. The, the, the 40th anniversary occurred there, um, a lot of other things. Um, and so then they started talking about um, uh, their experience there and and um, just some of the wild stories of crazy things they tried at the beginning. Uh, then we we continued driving through and, and looking at the different places where different things had happened, where Frank Pritzelik and uh, Judith had moved into the married dorm and other things like that. So it was, uh, I, I, uh, Geraldine, how long was that trip? Like two hours? Uh, my wife Geraldine was with us for all of that, and so it was about a two-hour tour. That sounds fun, and it's kind of just wild that it started here at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and it was at a time in the late '60s, early '70s, when people were experimenting in many different ways with revolutionary ways of thinking and acting yeah. in the world. So my understanding is that the Kresge College uh, um, that that was named Kresge just because of the donation would have been named um, Carl Rogers College. That it was based on Carl Rogers's work and his work in the human potential movement 
and and the very fact that they didn't give grades and it was it was for for people who already were were serious in their studies and their as students and so um it was it was about the exploration rather than the grades and i don't know if it's still that way but yeah in the 70s it was quite quite crazy mm -hmm. i graduated from ucsc in 1992 and at that time there were still not grades but it was already oh. shifting kind of to having grades again and now it's it it is sort of normal mm -hmm you know, the status quo, but it was uh -huh. a good, I think it was a good experiment. Over the years, I have not known that much about NLP and living in Santa Cruz, I sometimes have encountered people who have been involved with it. And I, I think that there are some ideas about it that probably you would say are not true. And I know that at the summit that you had here in Santa Cruz, this may have come up in discussion in terms of how NLP is perceived by others from the outside and how maybe to correct that. Sometimes NLP, people think that it means hypnosis or even that someone is, the NLP trainer is doing something to me to get me to do something like it's a self-serving process and yeah. may yeah. i don't even know if this is true but it, it appears that some people who have gotten uh very well known and wealthy through doing motivational speaking that they use nlp as part of their um yeah. box of tools and so then again nlp is has been associated with accumulation like so again sort of a selfish way of yeah. getting what you want in the world by manipulating other people yeah. I don't know if any or all of this sounds familiar and if so <laughs> yeah. um is that a part of what you were trying to talk about at the summit and um shift yeah yeah exactly um and, and you're being very kind in your descriptions because um yeah there are people who say that it's pseudoscience it's it's um uh, pure manipulation it's uh yeah it's uh trying to control people and and so that's the dark side uh, of the pr that's gone out and of course richard bandler has not helped i mean he's really he's one of the sources of all this stuff um with his murder trial there in santa cruz back in 1987 six and seven um and, and and some of the things that came out he said and other people have said that richard would have been convicted of murder but he he somehow manipulated the judge so that he didn't get convicted and and of course richard as uh, he's got a dark side to himself and 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 so because he went after hypnosis after they discovered the the basic communication model then they added the the hypnotic model and then they just got so wrapped up in hypnosis as the the cool thing that they want to do and then they did a lot and richard did a lot of stage hypnosis where he would get somebody up and bark like a dog or whatever and and so no wonder it got that the manipulation um branding and then uh you know tony robbins has run with it and 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 other like you say other motivational speakers use different pieces of it um and a lot of times it is very it is used to their benefit to the to the detriment of the people that's what we're trying to do on the summit, try, tr trying to get away from that and and make it more of a uh, of a scientific discipline and a um, and, and regulated. And so we've got everybody who's a part of the summit belongs to an association that has a code of ethics. Um, we've got a way of if somebody is in the summit and they're misusing it and 
people are complaining, then we've got a way of creating a discipline for it and either having them to leave or or to make some apologies and straighten up. Um, so that's what we're trying to do to create a better reputation reputation for it. It's easy to hold people who come up with great ideas in very high esteem and and hope that they don't have a dark side to them. And and then they they might may, maybe the initial tools from Bandler were really useful. And then what he's been doing since then is a little wonky. Um, but to still be able to use those original tools and develop those is interesting. What happened, I think, and and this was my, I wasn't there, so I don't know. This is my um, subjective judgment about it is that they they were actually Richard and John and Frank were actually shocked, surprised that it took off like it did, and and Richard and John. Uh, because they wrote that first book, then were accredited as creating a new psychology and a new therapy, and 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 that original book was translated into six languages. The first, second year it was out, mm-hmm. it, and I think because it was just so surprising, so big, they didn't have any idea of what they had, and apparently in the early seventies when they first started launching out from 75 onward um they would have they would have uh, training groups of 100 500 people 1000 people would come together and they were making a lot of money uh, apparently the financial statement in Richard's trial in 1986 in his trial um i, I think i think he said that uh, recorded that he had made 6 million dollars previous year well, with that kind of money, uh, they just ran with it, and they didn't put any any guides in about who can use this, how to use it, any ethics, and so, and also because they were just kind of so iconoclastic, and and just thumbing their nose at psychology in general, and saying they got it completely wrong, then they they created such an offense. And it took another 20 years before the field of psychology would actually consider even consider it. So, yeah, I think I think they didn't have a clue as to what they had. And and they had no administrative skills or administrative abilities. Um, I think each of them had a pretty large ego. And that was half the problem. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Even with good revolutionary ideas, the ego self-promotion can get in the way. It's interesting to hear about his trial, his murder trial, which I don't know that much about. Maybe it sounded like maybe that's the beginning of this perception that you can use hypnosis to even get out of uh, a murder trial, and this guy was successful at that. Yeah. yeah. At the murder trial, they they brought up things, uh, and the murder the murder trial was occurring just as I was entering into NLP. Uh, that was the same year that I founded and entered into it. And at the murder trial, there was testimony by lots of people that Richard always carried a big knife on his side, and. And he would pull out his knife from time and, and say, uh, "It's it's your it's uh, do this pattern or it's your life." There was something about Richard that liked being known as the bad boy. He would wear all black. He would he would have a knife on his side. He and he would talk about how he was going to beat someone up or murder someone. It was just part of his gang like uh, persona, and he loved scaring people. He used fear as more than motivation to to get people to change. And because he used that, and, and I mean, he talked like a sailor. He was just this and you. I mean, he, he just um, and he would shock people uh, with that language. Uh, get him up on stage and say, what the do you want? 
in recent years, Tony's Rocket's been doing that same thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I heard Rock, Tony one time in an interview say it was for the shock purpose. Um, he wants to get people off base and disoriented, mm-hmm. which, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the dark side of NLP. Do you even know what that murder trial was about? Who who was murdered? What was their relationship to Bandler? So a young a, a younger woman, I think she was early thirties. Uh, Corrine Christensen uh, was shot with a, a bullet right in her forehead, and uh, the two men that was in the house with her was Richard and another guy. I'll think of his name in a minute. He was a drug dealer in Santa Cruz. And so one of them pulled the gun and and shot her in the trial. They kept calling her uh, a whore, uh, a prostitute. Um, But it turned out that she was Richard's personal assistant and kept all the money and booked all the bookings and, and did everything like that. Uh, Her house was ransacked at right after the murder. And eventually the other guy, uh, he told the police where the gun was. And it, it had been dropped in the bay somewhere. And he went and showed them exactly. They pulled it out. And so instead of accusing him, who was a known drug dealer of the murder, they accused Richard of it. And so that that was the beginning of the murder trial. The last time I checked the um, uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel, um, it, it is the tr- and the court papers there in, in Santa Cruz is that the... the the murder trial is still open. That they've never accused anybody of the murder, never closed the case. Mm-hmm. I wrote a little book a few years ago, um, NLP Secrets, and kind of wrote about all of this and the murder trial. And and uh, Richard got off because there were so many people who came to his defense. I mean, like 300 people were character witnesses. Um, in his defense and so that was part of uh, that and and they just couldn't decide if it was this drug dealer or Richard who killed her it was one of them and their statements from the judges there was about five different judges over the period of time uh, of the trial uh, and the two or three of the judges said I know that one of these two men here in this court uh, killed her I just don't know which one Well, what's amazing, you've mentioned this a couple times, the notion of offering something that can help people kind of immediately to relieve anxiety, depression, sounds almost too good to be true. And so that idea can be used in in sort of a negative way. But you're, you're also describing earlier how you have really helped a lot of people in very short amounts of time. I don't know if you, that that's just, that that feels great to hear that, that you're able to help people really quickly. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you wanna say as we wrap up um, your most recent work or writings, and if you have any vision or hopes for the future as you keep using NLP and other techniques. So NLP is much more respected in Europe than than here um, or or in the East. Uh, we've got a lot of people in the East who there is such a uh, China, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, such a hunger for just a certificate. So people don't care hardly what you teach them, but they can get a certificate. Um, and so we got a lot of people who, who teach NLP like in three days. I mean, this is really very inadequate. But in Europe, they have established a lot of things. They've got NLPT, Neuro Linguistic Psychotherapy, and it's now accepted in 10 of the European uh, countries as a legitimate psychology and psychotherapy. Um, so they the associations of NLP in Europe have done much better job than the rest of the world. And so that's one direction it's going. And there's lots of people doing research. Um, there's research websites. There's 
where there's research uh, conferences going on. Um, and so it's going in that direction, really trying to make it much more legitimate. Um, what we've done with neural semantics, first of all, we changed the name so we didn't have to have that fight. <laughs> so it's not NLP, it's neural semantics, which then we've created our own code of ethics and, and processes. And what I've done in, in the last uh, six, seven years has been focusing um, e even below communication back to thinking. So I've just finished my 11th book on thinking um, and putting the focus there on on whether it's ex exact, executive thinking or metaphorical thinking or learning as a thinking thing or decision um, and focusing on it's critical thinking that allows us to really be most effective in our lives. Because uh, if the thinking is wrong, just about everything else goes wrong. My name is John Malkin, and this is Transformation Highway. This is KZSC 88.1 FM, kzsc.org, broadcasting from the University of California, Santa Cruz. You're listening to an interview with Robert Diltz and Michael Hall, authors and longtime instructors of neuro-linguistic programming. Here now is Robert Diltz. My basic mission, if you will, is to try to help create a world to which people want to belong mm. and in which they can thrive and to which they can contribute. But yeah, I think, yeah, and that's been a seed that's been there for a long time, actually, ever since my, my days many decades ago at UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> so. Well, that's a part of what I'd love to hear about. Because here I am in Santa Cruz, and I went to school here and yeah. never left because why <laughs> why leave? I, I completely understand. This is <laughs> similar to me. I mean, I have a house, my house in France, but my other place for the last 50 years has been Santa Cruz. So mm. tell me, may I'd love to hear about the early days of neuro-linguistic programming that sure. are here at Kresge College at UCSC and your involvement there. Before that, just yeah. so people have a general view right. of NLP, can you talk about what neuro-linguistic programming is for you? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the, it's it's one of those unfortunate names because it's a, a bit, you know, complicated, but you know, the idea of neuro-linguistic, you know, that's sort of the nervous system and language or communication and how those inter interact and produce the sort of pro programming through which we live. So that notion of programming is that, uh, you know, we develop essentially patterns of behavior and those patterns of behavior are going to be formed and shaped by the way that we think and the way that we speak and, and also uh, not just cognitively but also you know in our somatic you know our body the you know the, the nervous system goes through the whole body also you know obviously our nervous systems each interact with each other so nlp is trying to look at what are some of the dynamics of how that happens and and again even though the name sounds very complex and esoteric the reason that nlp is generally known around the world is because it sort of has been able to produce some very pragmatic kinds of tools and resources for people to, you know, communicate better and have better lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, but I, when I, if I have to really shorten my explanation, I always like to say, well, what title of one of my books is tools for dreamers. And so I say, you know, that's kind of what NLP is about is how do you, formulate a dream and kind of turn that into some kind of you know actual life experience you have written a lot of books and <laughs> yes. a lot of trainings in neuro-linguistic programming and and i think you have created or combined or condensed 
different aspects and created models and methods. Yes. Would you, and, and some of your approaches are from a spiritual angle, some are from a, a neurological angle, yeah. um, psychological. Say a little bit more about some of the tools you've developed over the years, maybe the most beneficial, or if you think of examples. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's a great question, John. The, so um, the, there's several that I know that are are widely used. Um, one of the simple ones is one that, uh, simple I means in a way, is one that was come out of doing kind of modeling. So NLP, another thing about NLP, I, I suppose I should say, is that the foundation of NLP is what we call behavioral modeling. And what behavioral modeling means is that you find a person or a group, uh, you know, a team, a group, or even a, a whole or, or whole organization could be that is doing something that seems to be particularly effective, exceptional, remarkable. And you're asking this question: What's the difference that makes the difference? You know, what what are they doing, or how are they approaching it that's different than the way that everyone else has been? And and then we're looking at these neuro linguistic, you know, distinctions, if you will. So one of the ones that I did, I uh, I actually, when I was at UCSC, interestingly, I started as an art major. My second year, I switched to a physics major. <laughs> My third year, I was a politics major. <laughs> and that's kind of when I got into linguistics and then eventually into neurolinguistics. And actually, my um, I uh, made my own degree, which was called behavioral technology, that kind of combined a bunch of these things that we were talking about, a little bit of spirituality, psychology, technology. Um, but so one of the things that I did uh, that did during that time was um, I got very intrigued by animation. And so I uh, studied Walt Disney. There was, I remember at UCSC, they had a, a kind of one of these retrospectives of the sort of history of animation. And I got very intrigued by seeing how how Disney really did revolutionize this whole um, field and kind of turned it into an art form. So I was, you know, wanting to find out, well, how did he do that? Plus then he made, you know, amusement parks and, you know, other live action films. And um, anyway, so that one of the things that I was very intrigued about and I've always been intrigued with is the whole creative process. And so I looked at, well, how did Disney, you know, how did he manage himself, his teams, his organization to create so many of these, you know, things that are still around today? And sort of the simple version of it was, uh, came across a comment that one of the people who had worked with him for many years said about him, which was, said, well, you know, there's actually three different Walt Disney's. There's the dreamer, the realist, and the critic. And the question is always, who's coming to your meeting that day? Uh really intrigued me. And so these would be things that from a neuro-linguistic perspective, you're going, oh, what, what does a dreamer do? What, what does that mean? And what is a realist? What, they're, they're different, they're sort of different mindsets, if you will. And so I set out to actually, you know, what you, what you would do with NLP is you would try to uh, buy, buy, you know, I, I watched some videos of him, I read things about him, but try to really get a sense of because because I couldn't actually go and you know speak to him obviously, but um, realize that so so dreaming is essentially visualizing it's using imagination, and in fact Disney called his creative process imagineering, which is the combination of imagination and engineering, it using visual imagination. In NLP, we would say then how do, so how do you how do you how do you imagine something if you you know what do you, what do you do to to dream. Uh, well, in NLP, one of the things that we look at is some things like body posture, eye movements, et cetera. And so I, you know, developed the system where we said, okay, if you want to dream, you're going to be looking up, you're going to be, you know, your sort of body's going to be open. And then there'll be certain questions that you're thinking of, you know, which is, you know, about the long-term future. Realist is different. A realist is more action oriented. It's not so much image oriented. What are you going to do? How will you, you know, what steps will you take? Disney, uh, of course, developed a whole process called storyboarding, where you take something and you chunk it down into bits of, bits of uh, you know, actions over time. 
And then the critic is much more analytical. It's much more verbal. So you kind of have what we call visual, somatic, or kinesthetic, and then verbal. And it's looking for, you know, how does something fit or not fit into certain values? What could go wrong? And just coding that because so often we, you know, we have our own inner critics and we encounter critics and all that. But to be able to be clear, okay, there's these three distinct processes. And if you mix them up, a lot of times when people get stuck creatively is they start to dream and immediately the critic comes in. You know, and starts to tear apart the dream, which is easy to do if it's only a dream. Um, but if you have a, if you start to have a good plan, then the critic becomes actually a, a good advisor. So this is, so that would be one example of something that has been used all over the world by many people. That's the way it's, you know, we're talking about the number of books that I've written, which I think is thirty something now. That's the process, exactly a process I use to write my book. So it's it's a really pragmatic, creative process. I would say the other thing, John, that is, and, and I, this is very relevant to the whole notion of, of transformation, the thing that I call the levels of change pyramid, which was actually inspired by uh, Gregory Bateson, who was a professor at UCSC. And did, he did, the, the, I, I took his class on ecology of mind, and he, he talked about this notion of levels of learning. That was something that really struck me. And I sort of use that as an inspiration for this notion of these different levels of change where you, you have you start on a very pragmatic level you have environment you know so if i want to transform my environment i've got to do that through behavior you know i've got to do physically do something to change the environment but then the question becomes how do i know what to do behaviorally you know so how, how what what you know transforms my behavior well, that's going to be my thinking process. And that's where the beginning of sort of neuro-linguistics, you know, some sort of strategy, some sort of mental model or mental map. But then beyond that, you have the question of, of well, why, why, you know, for, for which, you know, this is what I would call values and beliefs. Is this So you have the, the environment you could characterize as where and when you want to do something. Uh, behavior is what you want to do. Then there's the sort of level, I call it capability level. How are you going to do it? But then there's the belief and values level, which is why Why are you doing it? What's important? What's the priorities? Then you get up to a higher level, sort of the peak of the pyramid is, we call it, I would call identity. Who, you know, well, if, if you answer, sometimes if you're trying to answer these questions, why are you doing it that way? It's because of who you are, you know, um, what is my role? What is my mission? Mm. And then above that, you have what I would call a spiritual level, which is beyond myself. The fact that I am part of something bigger than me that I serve and that I benefit from, but also it's what gives me meaning. And so this is a, so we would say, you know, to, to have a complete transformation, you're going to sort of have it on all of these different levels. Mm. And, and in fact, kind of the notion here is that any change I make at these higher levels will necessarily cascade into changes at the other levels. If, if I change my identity, my values, you know, my priorities are going to change with that. If I change from being in a role, let's say, as a teacher to my role as a parent, my values are going to change. The things that I capabilities I'm going to use are going to change. The obviously the environment I'm in changes, and so a lot of times when I'm working with people, which I would do either as a coach or a consultant, we're sort of looking at well, you know, what is the change, the transformation that they want to have in their life? Which level or levels are going to be the most important to let's say leverage, if you will, in order to make that happen? And then I, one of my books is called From Coach to Awakener. And what that book details is what are some of the tools that you would use to actually, you know, like, like changing behavior is not the same as changing belief. If changing behavior, you could pretty much use the kind of Skinnerian Pavlovian conditioning. But that kind of conditioning, like, like, for example, you could put somebody like Nelson Mandela in prison for 30 years. <laughs> you know, you could limit his behavior, but it does not at all 
change his belief, you know, or his sense of identity or his sense of spiritual purpose. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, what are the dynamics then by which belief changes or identity changes? And, and that's what um, a lot of my, my books are about. So I, I mean, so, so that's a couple of examples and hopefully I know that's a lot. <laughs> Maybe that's too much, but not too couple. much and and interesting in a lot of different ways. Hmm. There was a period where I was always asking people about internal and external hmm. transformation and the relationship of the two. Hmm. And the people I'm usually drawn to and interested mm -hmm. in are people that are bringing these together in some mm. way, uh, mm. transformation, liberation, mm. um, and moving towards, you know, a healthy combination of these. Um, yes. And we do live in paradise. It is really <laughs> yeah. amazing. I Especially, you know, especially if you live in Santa Cruz. <laughs> I know. And a lot of people are struggling. Maybe, maybe more than half the world doesn't have enough food every day, Absolutely. clean water Absolutely. and shoes. And um, and we we also live in this strange world where a lot of those people who don't have food and shoes, they have an AK-47 somehow. Right. That's right. really it's bizarre. It is. You, you know, you happen to be going to UCSC maybe in the late 60s uh early 70s mid -70s. Early 70s yeah early 70s yeah early 70s and i was born in 1963 and mm. grew up with this um us war on vietnam happening and then mm. hearing that world war ii had been the last big war and it was the war to end war making yeah. and i've really had this optimistic view that there would at least be much less war happening during my lifetime. And it's not really the case. And I think that you were actively protesting the U.S. war in Vietnam. I don't know if there was a relationship that that period of time, 1968 to 1975, mm. there was revolutionary internal and external revolutionary movements happening. What's the relationship of that to NLP? Yeah, well, that that's a that's a great question, and 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 thank you for bringing that up because I do think you know. So NLP was was born in that period, obviously, and and um, NLP you know came out of UCSC, which you know was was probably the most progressive, certainly the most progressive of the UC schools, maybe the most progressive university to, to date. I don't know. You know, there was no grades. There was you know uh, you you had evaluations. It was all co-ed. You know. Before, before that was, it was like all revolutionary. And um, we were all of the age. I mean, you know, I, I was 18 and draft age. And, um, you know, you, that was, that was definitely a, something was on everybody's mind and uh, wanting to do something about it. And so I think that was, there was this whole sense of revolution. You know, you know another, I think another sort of an interesting parallel is that NLP was developing really at the, almost the same time that uh, personal computing was developing. You know, so Bandler and Grinder, who were the founders of NLP, uh, were just over the hill from Wozniak and Jobs, you know, who were creating Apple. And this whole idea, and I, and I think this sort of metaphor of big blue, you know, and taking back, you know, the freedom, the, the pro, put the programming is in our hands. It's not in the government's hands, et cetera. And this was very much, even I think, even why why programming became part of neuro linguistic programming is because it was, it was this place where you could actually, you know, you were in charge. You know, you, you were not being programmed. You 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 had the ability to be by by having the level of awareness, uh, and having the support. You could actually be in charge of your own programming rather than your family, your school, your culture. You know your the, whatever political party was in in charge at the time, so there was very much definitely a this sense of wanting to take back, you know, the the sort of um, um, agency you know of your life into your own hands, but also wanting to make a difference in the world. 
you know, Steve Jobs famously saying, you know, I want to make a dent in the universe, you know. So, and and the other interesting thing, John, it was, and I've talked to my my wife about this, who grew also grew up in San Jose. Her her dad was working as a, I think he was head of technology for IBM, <laughs> Big Blue at the time, although he was much more radical than the typical Big Blue. Anyway, that there was this feeling that you could do anything, you know, you. We, and and even you know Steve Jobs dropped out of college. You know you, you didn't have to have a college degree. <laughs> you know basically you had to have passion and a vision and a and a desire and a will to make a difference, and you could. And it was sort of that was kind of the feeling that we had with NLP. You know every new thing that came out, we went you know, this is going to change the world. You know this will this is going to make a difference in the world. And in a way we you know we were right. NLP is is around the world, although. There's still, as you point out, uh, a lot of things that are <laughs> I wish had been able, had been changed. But uh, you know, so I think that it was definitely that context, that sense of change the world, take back your choice into your own hands, was all very much part of that that mindset. I was watching some videos that are online of you, and also of. Richard Bandler and John Grinder and mm -hmm. kind of trying to get a better idea of what they mm -hmm. were all about and where neuro linguistic mm -hmm. programming came from. Mm -hmm. in, in this one film that you're interviewed in, it's called Altered States. It's oh, yes. Richard Bandler. Um, <laughs> yes. What you think of that particular film, but there's a part where Bandler is talking about how he came up with this name, neuro linguistic programming, which. Yeah. Maybe, maybe is a little flippant that that little story um, yeah. of an encounter with a police officer, but the the idea that the idea of programming, when I hear that, I feel a little concerned about sure. treating human beings like machines or like computers, right. and and so it's really delightful hearing you explain a little more right now that you're you're kind of coming from the opposite point of view yes um yeah human yeah. human autonomy and choice and non-authoritarian you you mentioned bf skinner too just a few minutes ago yes because i was thinking about skinner as i'm thinking of talking with you there was a time uh i was in my 20s and i read some bf skinner this book walden Two. Yes, right, I, right. I happened to be, I at the time I was living on this hippie, organic, biodynamic, <laughs> off-the-grid farm in Australia of yeah. activists, you know, anti-nuclear activists too. Wow. And okay. I read this book and and I kind of loved the book because it was sort of saying, we can all live together. Here's a model yeah. of it. And, but then I felt, also, and then I explored Skinner more, and and he, he was this control society model right. that is now really what we live inside of this punishment and reward model, exactly. which I'm gathering you are outside of. Yes, yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, like like I said, I think you know, punishment and reward can it, it's it shapes behavior. It does not create transformation. Uh, you know, the the deepest part of our identity is it's something beyond any type of punishment or reward, and you can see that in people who have, you know, the, I mean, sure, many of people that we both admire and respect. You know, they're they're coming from a very different place. They're they're certainly willing to suffer tremendously. You know, so it's not going to go. Oh no, I just I, I don't want to do that because it's going to hurt. You know, or something. You know that, that I think that's the that's one of those differences that makes a difference, especially when you get up to this very deep level. What one of my one of my books is called Tools of the Spirit, and it's you know sort of about that sense of you know when when you you connect to something bigger than yourself. And I it's cer certainly one of the big dynamics that I work with a lot, especially these days, is the the you could call it the the balance, the dynamic between ego and soul. And so by ego, I don't necessarily mean Freud, by a soul, I don't mean religion, but I mean, our ego is that, you know, we are, one part of our reality is that we are a separate, independently thinking, creative individual. 
The other part of our reality is that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. We're part of families, communities, professions, and that our, you know, our meaning comes from the, the service that we provide. So, so you, on the one hand, you know, we need to, we need to get and to grow, but we also need to, you know, to give and to serve. One of my, uh, actually, one of my favorite, I don't know what you call it, sayings, readings is from the Nobel Prize winner Rabindranath Tagore, where he said, "You know, I, I slept, and I dreamt that life was joy. I awoke, and I saw that life was service. I served, and I discovered service was joy. You know, so you kind of create this, you know, this loop, and um, yeah. So I, I think the." To me, the basic, really the basic teaching of NLP ultimately is that we are not our programming. <laughs> You're more than your programming. But we can, if we're not conscious, in and in, in many of us and in, in where you don't you don't have the training, you're not encouraged to have the mindfulness, the self-awareness, then basically you're not much more than the programming because you know, <laughs> that's that's what you've taken on. There's a whole there's a whole um, dynamic I call thought viruses, and a thought virus would be a, a thought or a belief that's not mine. I didn't come up with it from my own personal experience, but you know it's there, just like a physical virus or a computer virus. It's there in in the the, the environment, and if you take it on, it can become you. I mean, it, it takes over the mechanism, uh, but it isn't you. And, you know, and if you, one of my latest books, I'm trying to actually help people to sort of develop what I might call a, you know, an internal uh, virus detection program. So you can go, I, let's, if you, as you listen to the political rhetoric, the divisiveness that's around in our world, how do you know, you know, the conspiracy theories, et cetera. To me, there's all of these very typical red flags that, that come out. So, you know, anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely, I mean, I think, as I say, sort of my, definitely my mission is, um, has always been wanting to create, you know, bridges rather than barriers, you know, wanting to create, you know, uh, something that's generative and innovative rather than that is restricting and homogenizing, you know, so, and I, I think that all comes out of that era that we grew up in, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it was really an important time. I, for years and years, I would say out loud, I wish I had been alive during the sixties. And then I realized I was alive during most of the sixties. <laughs> you were. I, I was just born. Uh, <laughs> oh, well. Um, but, but you know what, John, the, the, one of the things that we work with as well, and I think this might be very interesting and may, maybe also trigger something as part of our, our discussion. We say, there's there's three intelligences so so one is the cognitive intelligence which is what most you know people think of as intelligence then you've got a somatic intelligence which we know that most most creatures have somatic intelligence you know uh, especially mammals you know they're they're not you know they're not thinking you know verbalizing beings but there's a somatic intelligence that's in the body then there's what we call a field intelligence. And the field intelligence is not within the individual. Actually, one of the things that Gregory Bateson said, he said that um, he used to say that the mind is imminent, meaning you know, it emerges out of things. It's it's you know, it's not separate from, it's emerges from the interaction. And he said, but it's it's imminent, but not only in the body. He says it's imminent in pathways and messages outside of the body. He said, and the individual mind is a subsystem in a bigger mind that maybe people it might be comparable to God, maybe what people call God, but it's still imminent in the whole social, you know, interactive and social system. And the reason I bring that up is that the field of the sixties was there. And when your nervous system was forming, <laughs> you may have been more influenced by the sixties than the people who were 20 years old in the sixties, because it was in, you know, it's, it's the water you were swimming in. And it was being co-created. So it's, I, I, I mean, I, when I look at you, I was born in 1955. So I was somewhat, you know, uh, self, you know, self-aware in the, in the sixties, definitely felt 
growing up, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, I was a, a, a contemporary of Steve Jobs, you know, so I, I think there was very much this sense of we are here to make <laughs> to, to make a, make the biggest positive difference we can. Mm -hmm. But I would say you were you were in the 60s. <laughs> I was in the 60s. And I've just I've been a part of a lot of different activism yeah. and envisioning a future, for example, without police and prisons, where right. when people harm each other rather than harming that person, we really need better systems and maybe also creating cultures where there's just less harm in general yeah. to deal with. That would be really good. What you're saying about beliefs and judgment, self-judgment and yes. mindfulness, for me, meditation and then Buddhist psychology, which, which is, can also be really complex with simultaneous understandings of our relationship inside, outside with the world. There, there's a reality of my experience. There's a broader reality that's happening and uh, various combinations of all of that. How important, well, I, I just know for myself, sitting quietly and noticing my thoughts and practicing watching them and, and seeing what they are and how often they're happening without a judgment trying to squash them. I know, I, I think that in neuro-linguistic programming, it's really important in changing beliefs, not to try to squash them, push them away, but bring some mindfulness. How important is, is meditation or mindfulness to you? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a, that is also another re super rich and interesting question. So a couple of things, John. Number, number one is one of, the, one of the main forces at the beginning of NLP, or one of the main, and the main people that were modeled by Bandler and Grinder was a man named Milton Erickson who did hypnosis. But his form of hypnosis was not the, you know, <laughs> I'm controlling your brain hypnosis. It was, it was much more mindfulness, was much more sitting you know, introspecting, paying attention. So one of the first things we all learned was self-hypnosis. And and now my wife, my wife is a mindfulness meditation teacher. She studied with Jack Cornfield and and sort of that whole sort of the the more Buddhist uh, influenced traditions. And she also, I met her because she was an interpreter. So she's she's just a little older than you. She was born in 1960 in San Jose, but. Um, and she went to France as a young person and then ended up starting to do interpreting and has interpreted a lot of the most of the main consciousness teachers and spiritual teachers that you know, from English into French. One of the things that she said, she, you know, she has interpreted John Grinder and all these other people as well. So she said she believes that NL, when NLP is one of the greatest potential tools for mindfulness because it gives you things to be aware of. But so if you put together this notion of of hypnosis, which is about, you know, you're still, you're reflecting, you are getting outside of the cognitive mechanism, you know, the, the, the tyranny of the conscious cognitive mind, if you will. But then if you have in the self-witnessing point of view, you can then be aware of that. This is what allows you to begin to get some kind of, you know, transcendence, some kind of separation. Then it becomes very interesting to go, well, so wh who am I without my thoughts? <laughs> you know, who am I without those beliefs? What becomes possible if I'm able to, you know, transcend that? I think this is where, I mean, I would say maybe another little thread here is one of the series of books that I wrote is called Strategies of Genius. We're looking at many well-known, you know, starting with well-known genius, geniuses like well, uh, Walt Disney, but Mozart, uh, you know, Tesla, you know, a number of other people, Einstein, they have a whole volume on Einstein. And one of the things that became really obvious is that all of these geniuses say essentially the same thing. The place where they're, they had the genius, they, they just didn't say, you know, I sat there and I figured it out. <laughs> and they said, 
And like Mozart was very clear. He said, I cannot sit down and make the music. Uh, what I can do is I can put myself in a state where the music comes to me. And so it doesn't come from me. It comes through me. And Einstein said the same thing. He said, I did not come up with any of my theories by, said, by, by you know, manipulations of mathematical axioms. He said, no productive thinker could you know, think in such a paper fashion. So one of the things that becomes clear is that these moments where something radically new comes is when we're in that place of silence, stillness, spaciousness, and then there's room for something more <laughs> than the typical the stuff that's already been you know downloaded, if you will. My name is John Malkin, and this is Transformation Highway on KZSC 88.1 FM, kzsc.org, broadcasting from the University of California, Santa Cruz. You've been listening to an interview with two instructors of neuro-linguistic programming, Michael Hall and Robert Diltz. They were in Santa Cruz in January 2024 with about 100 NLP trainers from 15 countries to attend a leadership summit. NLP was originally developed here at the University of California, Santa Cruz by Richard Bandler and UCSC professor John Grinder. Special thanks to Angela Bachfeldt in Berlin for setting up these interviews. 